Okay, welcome back to what is now episode 10 of Ag Inspire. My name is Tommy Heffernan, and the concept is quite simple. It's to have inspire conversations with interesting people doing inspiring things in agriculture. And my next guest is absolutely no different. He's somebody who's been very kind to me um, with his knowledge and time around farming systems and herd performance. That's veterinary consultant Martin Kavanagh. Um, well known in Ireland, but also recognized internationally for the work that he does to Cow Solutions, his company. Master Cow Singles Trainer, grad certain dairy herd health amongst other things but most importantly today martin first of all how are you keeping and, and thanks for your time this morning oh, that's great tommy yeah uh, time it's always good to take time out to have a chat and i think we kind of miss having chats at the minute i miss uh yeah with the whole covid thing and everything i haven't had enough chats lately i think so so this is a real it's a good idea it's a pleasure yeah uh, conversations can be fantastic. They can be where you learn mm. so much, Martin. Um, Martin, I suppose, look, I've had many conversations with you and you've, you've been very uh, kind with your time and your knowledge. Um, but I, like with everybody, I, I suppose for people to understand where people are and where people are going, um, a little mm. a, a, a trip down memory lane or, or back into the past for Martin Kavanagh. You're obviously a veterinarian. You, you started out in practice. Give people some insights into you. I know you're a consultant now, but you know how, what, what's your journey been mm. through? Um, I, yeah, I, and I think we might get to it later on in the conversation, Tommy. We might talk about that term consultant a little bit and see what that means and maybe where I've come with that one. But where I started off, I saw a cow calving, I think I was five or six. You know that funny memory you have as a child? And it might have been that age. And my dad and my family, they were very involved in farming and, and they were they were cattle buyers and dealers uh, in the good old days. So, yeah, I grew up with cows um, in, into the 1980s. So I, I, so I really came, became aware of the farming piece at the milk quota point, uh, the 83, 84. And that, and that was a real tra transformative point, I think, uh, for my own dad, where he would have been a reasonable size farmer and a good few cows and would have been investing a lot of money and getting moving and putting in things like cubicles at that stage, you know, in the, in the late seventies. And um, so, and that absolutely, the quota put the brakes on, on, on everything at that point. And in 1984, I went to Gertrude Knight College as an ag student after my leaving cert. Um, I spent a year there, which was really good because they had a great um, ethos. And we got to work with all species there, everything from turkeys, pigs, sheep, the whole lot, very different from ag colleges now. And it was very, very practically oriented. Um, and there was about 120 students, I'd say 110 students there at the time. Um, and from there, I went into veterinary. I didn't do terribly well initially. I actually left it for a bit and uh, I went off farming for a couple of years at home. Um, and I learned a lot there in, from that point of view of just bloody well milking cows and, do, and doing all that kind of good stuff. And then I went back to veterinary again, really at the behest or the kindness of John Hannon, who was dean at the time, a real gentleman. Um, and he kind of said, well, you know, come back in. I, I didn't have enough points, <laughs> but I got back in through through the, the two-year rule in UCD or whatever it was at the time. And I went back in, I finished the vet degree then. So 14 years in practice after that, 15 years. And then I, 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 I kind of segued off into the into a distance. That segue from practice is something I've been through myself. It's a massive mm. move, you know. Um, it's, a, it's a huge, it's, 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 it's a tipping point in your career and, and, and the decision mm. to move from practice. And you were like myself, I know from conversations, you, you did not mm. lot like practice, but you saw other opportunities mm. maybe and, and saw the landscape maybe changing around you. But still to make that move, it's it's not something you do overnight uh or well maybe my wife says that i i probably did it overnight but anyway um you know how, how, what 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 was the the main driving force there martin to make that decision yeah there was a number of drivers i i, I was a very happy practitioner though busy and i and i think at that time in the in the in the 90s uh, a lot of vets and, and loads of guys still working there in practice uh, now who would have gone through the experience we're enormously busy, did piles of calls, vets are rated on how fast they were, uh, you know, clinically pretty good in the sense of you just saw a lot of stuff and you dealt with it. Brought in a lot of new sort of innovation. Like I remember in the practice, the first time we did an LDA, like, and we weren't taught that in college. And um, it, it, it's all that kind of stuff. So innovations that we did then are commonplace now. And again, vet practitioners now will find the exact same thing. So 
it was a different landscape and, and, and it, it, it was tough, tough work, but very, very enjoyable. But I think the difference, the driver for me was probably into the 2000s, farms getting a little bigger, uh, there was a little bit more of a push on. And I was just treating over and over again, the same herd type nutrition related problems. And I had no background in it. And I think as vets at that point, we, we, we didn't really have that type of knowledge or background. So I started messing about with it. And that's how I got involved with Keenan's using diet wagons and dry cow diets. I got really interested in the whole dry cow thing. So, so that brought me up on that radar where I started getting interested in that. And I did, um, I spoke at a seminar way back in 1990 something. Um, and and from that uh, it sort of it developed a sort of an uh, an interest in, in in the nutrition piece, and back up picked up on and I got offered a job. So I kind of had to make a choice, and I was forty years of age, and it was a bit of a tipping point at that stage. Do I stay on in practice? Do I spend lots of money? You know, so on, so on, so on, so on. So I, I headed for the business direction, um, and it's it's been really interesting. I I, I think you end up in this very you're completely naive actually about how the world works in lots of ways because it, within practice you're very much within this sort of bubble of your own practice and your own geographical area your own clients cows systems and that's what you understand and you're often king of that and vets are in their, in their regions but the minute you start walking out of that uh, it's a totally different ballgame you realize the huge diversity in agriculture um, and the way people do things. And you also have to learn how to be uh, a cross-disciplinarian. You have to become much more generalist. And I learned from then going into a business, a structured business um, of how to actually deal with marketing, sales, uh, nutrition guys, technical expertise, manufacturing, all that sort of good stuff. So while I was certainly not a great fit for industry, I don't think a lot of independent vets are. And uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's it's kind of a funny. It's a whole other conversation. But but I think I think what I learned out of that, and I learned out of that type of corporate structure, was very important. And also what I learned about the corporate drivers. So what got me in there was an understanding that I had to learn more to have more effect at a herd level. I didn't know where to go, and I stepped out of practice to do it. I think that's really what drove it. I think if I had the opportunity, maybe to do um, you know a specialist study. Uh, within the veterinary sphere in that area at that time, it may have been different. But actually, that avenue really wasn't there for us as, as Irish vets. It is now, you know, it, it is more right so. now, but it is something certainly that because it is yeah. more specialized, Martin, isn't it? Like, you talk, oh, yeah, yeah. We want to talk about farm systems and a little bit in farm performance, but mm, it's mm. a totally different. And, you know, we often talk, James Harriet is, is, is uh, maybe the person that people reference back as sure, sort of yeah. veterinary influence, um, you know, the, the late cause in the buckets of hot water, but these farms are totally changing. Um, it's, yeah. it's a different beast now um, than maybe the the, the ideal yeah. the ideological role of, of your large animal veterinarian. Not that that work isn't very important still. Sure, it, it's definitely evolving very quickly, isn't it? Yeah, and, and I think you can get you can get you can get sidetracked a little bit with this, Tommy, because even working on large industrial farms, and I use that term carefully. I don't use it as a pejorative, not in any way. But say larger scale farms where we're dealing with a large workforce and so on. You know, funny enough, the role of the clinical vet as against the kind of that consultative vet is hugely important. And this is something that I probably wasn't really aware of. You get into this thing that, you know, all vets need to become sort of, you know, animal, large animal or herd consultants uh, to, to, to move forward. But actually, the need for very good clinicians is, is huge. And I, I, I see that um, on, on the bigger units where we need vets who have... Um, very, very uh, good diagnostic skills, very good understanding of large animal science, infectious disease control, so on, so on, so on. And we need them. We need, like, it's because I find I am not, if I'm consulting as such, and we're talking about herd performance, I am not necessarily with the cows on a clinical basis. And if we look at animals from a welfare sense, and they have to have a life that's worth living, let's, let's call it that. Um, the, the importance of veterinary first line care or veterinary treatment in bringing animals from a negative experience to a balanced or a neutral experience within their welfare is enormously important. So I think we've got to be real careful with that conversation. And it worries me a little bit. And I see that universally is that lots of talk about vets having to be or having to have a set of consultative skills. 
but I, I would really regret that if it, if it put pay to that first line, high quality clinical care emergency skills that a huge amount of Irish vets in particular have, uh, which actually is not reflected in every country abroad, not by any means. You, you've traveled a lot with your work as well, Martin. So you, mm. you, you come from, you were, you're practicing in Tipperary and suddenly now you're exposed to international travel. Um, yeah. International different systems as well. You know, what, what were some of your big lessons there when you looked at different systems? Because we're in a grass-based system here. You're going to much more intensive production systems with indoor cows. Sure. What were the big things that you kind of took note of as you made that transition out um, from, from private practice? Yeah, uh, I suppose the first thing is when you're getting on planes a lot, make sure you get a seat with enough leg room. I think that's really, that's, that's the lesson that I learned very quickly. And don't get too panicked about getting to the airport in time. Uh, I, I think that my experience with Keenan's, I work with Keenan's as uh, on a consultant. I work with them full time for a, for a period of time, and then I worked as a, as a consultant uh, as a consultant with them. And they gave me a huge opportunity for international travel, and also, I suppose I learned a lot about nutrition from that point of view. But also, I learned about the concept of system uh, as it applied to me, and where commercial companies with one particular default position struggled in different systems. And that's not necessarily Keenan's applies to a number of companies. Um, but when I moved into different systems and I went from Irish system, we have to remember, say, mid-90s, it really started to take off that there was a heavy New Zealand influence coming into the country through Leon Foster, Golden Vale, all that kind of stuff. Particularly, actually, in the tip region, we really encountered uh, sort of the rise of the discussion group very, very quickly. And vets were often at the, at the um, opposite end of that because what we were prescribing as vets was not fitting maybe with that model. And a lot of the time, the model that was being uh, put in place in terms of, you know, grass, lower feeding levels and so on, was not appropriate for the cow type. But we actually didn't know that at the time. And I think we ended up even with conflict with the system and poor understanding of, of, of the pastoral system. Um, so it, it wasn't, I think, until I went abroad and started really working with uh, very intensive indoor dairies and also a lot of non-intensive indoor dairies that were being run very poorly did you actually realize the benefits some of the benefits we have with our system and also some of the steps that we had to make to make that better and ireland is unique in in many ways in my experience it, uh, a lot of very very high quality independent advice is poured into the agricultural system here um, and it's been it hasn't been driven by commercial interests primarily um, I, I think we've locked very much into a system going through on Forest Taluntas, ACOT, Chagas, and so on. And that, that, and that evolvement of, of, a, of a system which is based on profitability and cost management, which was not, is not reflected in a lot of other systems. So I walked into intensive systems abroad that were based on, on production. That was it. It was a production-based system, not cost, not profit. And, and that was a huge learning experience. So I had to learn how to introduce even some of those concepts of, uh, you know, it's not necessarily always better to produce more or have more cows. I see a huge amount of dairy systems affected by the more cow logic is if I have more cows, I'll make more money, I'll get more milk. Um, and that's not unusual. I think Ireland cracked that one a little bit earlier, even though we, we didn't realize it. But I think the, the fact that we were quota bound and we dealt with cost has matured us in a different way. And I think that experience has been invaluable going abroad. And the experience of going abroad coming back has been maybe, again, understanding how systems work and where people fit into those systems and how labor management, lean, all that kind of stuff starts to fit in and what you can fit into an Irish context, you know? Have we slipped back, and this is, and uh, look, we've, we've made massive advances, but have we slipped sure. back with that idea of more cows now rapid rapid expansion again which is you know if i was a dairy farmer that's where i'd be looking to grow my business sure. of course, it's understandable but you have you you know you have seen a situation where more cows where you take out some of the cows in the system the system improves overall um, and sure. are, are we back in a bit of a calibration stage again martin for various reasons and i think they'll be pushed externally upon us maybe environmental um legislation but you know, what's your opinion there? Do we kind of, do we go at 100 miles an hour, we need to slow back again and maybe look at the overall system again? Yeah, I, and, and I, I look, and this is one and often it's a binary argument, uh, Tommy, like, like, you know, more cows wrong, less cows right, all this kind of stuff when we start, we start looking at how we look at pastoral systems. And I think what's really interesting as we look at pastoral systems, how they will fit into that future, um, how we can do pastoral systems a little bit better, 
we're converting a non-utilizable food, et cetera, et cetera. All that greenhouse gas stuff that some of your other guests have talked about and people that you've spoken about too. But um, it, it's all within context. And this is where I think uh, consultancy or advisory can fail a lot if you don't look at within the context of within the own farm gate or within the region itself. And I think some farms have no bother with expansion models because they have the resources, the capability, the wherewithal to manage an expansion model. I mean, I, I've worked with farms here in, in Ireland itself that have gone from, you know, that 70, 80 cow model into that four or 500 cow model without a breeze and actually have done it extremely well, have made a lot of money out of it. And I've seen other people then fall into that, what, what I would have termed the in-betweener zone where they, they have too many cows to manage themselves, but they don't have enough cows to get enough labor or resource in there. They actually don't have enough capital. It's not capitally financed, you know, correctly. So if people manage the financial end of it, resource it correctly, you can do it quite well. I think where we slip up is that we don't build the system correctly. I'm banging on about system again. No. But if you leave, you know, if you leave out elements of the system, you can get badly caught by it, yeah. Let's take the systems, because I sat with you, yeah. Horse and jockey, and you scrawled on a on a whiteboard as you were very kind to tell me your thinking, and I've heard you speak about it before publicly, so it, it's not a trade secret anymore. But it's, sure. it it may seem uh, like a simple idea, but what drives herd performance and profit is people, nutrition, the environment of animals, um, and you've got the herd to help peace again. So uh, you know, you, like it's 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 really important to break it out like that because that's what differentiates you in your understanding. And I suppose it differentiates you in the work that you do as well, Martin. You know, you're a vet, but you're 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 not you're not in this herd help piece as we call it. It's the performance of the farm and the system, um, and people, the environment, and nutrition are tr very very key drivers. Am I right in saying that? Yeah, Tommy, I, and I think uh, and I think this is one thing I. I I think if we're talking, if we like both of us have stepped stepped outside of practice and we're talking about some of this this, this consultative role, and when we stand back and we look at this stuff, and sometimes it's very hard to, to parse it or to break it down. And this is there was a huge difficulty I found is that you're you're locked in 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 BVD or you're locked in nutrition or you're locked in cubicle comfort or whatever it is, and, and you don't see out beyond that. It's your it's your little niche. It's your you know it's your expertise. And I think it takes time to get out beyond that and you see the different elements fitting. So, yeah, on top, herd health cow, is, is the cow fit for purpose? Is our feed management system fit for purpose? Is the environment we put them in fit for purpose? And as we as people, everybody working with that system, are we able to function with that system through discipline, process, protocols, procedures? How do we lay all of that out? And, and But also what's very important, that's a within farm gate part of the profitability piece. The center of that system is profitability. And profitability is different things to different people. Everyone says, oh, you know, it's too, it's too financially oriented. And some of that is money, money to put the kids through school, you know, ha have your family work, uh, you know, have everything you need for your family. But also other farmers uh, can look at profit another way. I want to, I want to have a farm that is, is a pedigree based farm where my cows look like this, or I want to have an organic farm, or I want to have a farm that's biodiverse or whatever. And all these are profitable elements so that you must incorporate to a system. So on, until I drive down a farm gate or have that conversation with the farmer, the family, whoever is involved, are the actors in that system. Do you understand what you're trying to achieve? And that's why this type of advisory or this type of work is very bespoke. You have to look at what's happening on that farm itself. And what I found more and more, particularly as, I'm, uh, as, I, as I get to know more farmers better, is that the impact of the, the family dynamics in the system can be enormous, even in quite big farming businesses. So how we're getting on with the brother or how integrated is, 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 is the family side of it in and how do you manage all that? What's the relationship between say father and son, father and daughter uh, within those? And so I often find that 90% of the work I do within systems is actually looking at what is the dynamics or what are the dynamics of the people working within it and can you move forward or you know, forward or not? Uh, and I'm not a psychologist. I, I'm not. That was my next. I'm, that was my next question know. because we certainly don't. Um, we do, certainly don't uh, specialize in psychology when we're in veterinary college. No. Uh, it's not no. part of the curriculum. It, we're dealing with people on a continual basis, whether mm. it be pets or large animals. It's very important. It's an area I'm interested in from my own personal, I suppose, well-being and everything like that. Yeah, I'm sure. In. And it's not a skill set that we that comes naturally to a lot of us. 
how did you how did you develop that within yourself that understanding of people to step back and look at it i know you've had vets in training and they've been blown away by your you know putting people into different colors and you know that understanding of the human psyche and human behavior how did you personally develop that interest and in, uh, and how, how did you learn more and get better at it uh Okay, a, a couple of main main features. I mean, first of all, uh, w one key thing is the realization that um, you every day you go on, you know less about it, and, and I and I think if you keep that in mind, you're prepared to learn more. You know, and, and I think I think it's it's having a level of openness. Uh, person one that would have affected that, I think, would have been my own father. It was very a, a very empathetic man. So he had very good understanding of animals and husbandry, he, but he wasn't aspirational. He didn't, he didn't have to have the biggest cow, the best cow, the highest yield, anything like that, but he was empathetic. And, and there was an interesting comment, actually, uh, God forbid, he, 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 he passed away a good number of years ago, but I remember a farmer commenting to my wife at the time, he said, God, if you fell out with Mikey Cavanagh, you, you knew you were in the wrong. Right. And I thought it was a very, so he had a very quiet, empathetic nature to him, which, which was hopefully he's passed on a tiny bit in his genes. Um, other people, I think, would have influenced going through practice as you learn to work with people and do pro bono work as you would have encountered yourself and deal with people and deal with the tragedy that people go through. Uh, every day even within their own lives and the recognition that you never know how much someone else's problem is inside the, inside the farm and I think vets on the ground again are very close to that and they're very they're very fortunate if they're again they're open enough to it to become that sort of trusted individual I think then as I said to you before we started when I did cow signals training and back in 2009 and I think the guys who are doing it Yup and Jan Yuprice and Jan Holson I think Yup was on was on your podcast as well um, they were in their infancy with it, but Yoop is a very strong communicator. And I did this master's training with them, but I went back a couple of years later and I spent a week with the guys. I, I paid them for the pleasure and they literally took my personality apart and put it back together again and told me all the really bad things I do in terms of the way I interact with people. And I'm still, I still have to wake up in the morning and say, I better not do that again. You know, I, I'm still learning from that. The, and that was a very useful experience. Um, working with a company that dealt with sales and marketing is very important. I think you have to understand how, uh, how people think and how they operate and how they accept messages and how they go through learning. I, I, and I see in your own work, Tommy, you, you know, you're doing a lot of that. And I see the way you present yourself that you're looking at, at how people buy that message. Uh, and you have to understand that and you have to understand the different categories where people operate in. So very useful to work with professional salespeople, professional salespeople who understand the dynamics of how people accept, accept messages. The rest of it then is trial and error is actually getting it wrong. So, so I think in when I would have started doing this back in the 2000s, I probably out of 10, five times I would get it wrong. I would completely fail to communicate with people. And I'd say, why the hell didn't they understand what I was saying about deep dip or whatever the hell, you know? And um, I'd say now I kind of get it right seven to eight out of 10. And that's just because you just have done it a lot, but you're never going to get 10 out of 10 because you know yourself, the way you get out of a car, the way you present yourself, the way your body language, instantly some people are just going to absolutely hate you. They're just not going to like you. It doesn't matter what you say. And, and that's it. And, and, and how can you manage those type of situations? And what's your awareness, your openness to it? So the very last point on that is you gave me a very good acronym. And MG uses a lot in people signals. And I, I do a people signals presentation as well, our communication piece. Uh, and we talk about clarity, be clear, being honest, having empathy and having respect. So the acronym is SHARE. So we always put up a picture of SHARE when we're talking about this. But that's it. And, and, and that's the one thing that, so I would have got that from my dad, that, that honesty, that empathy piece. The respect piece, I think, comes with you just freaking grow up and, and, and you get out of this concept of loving animals and loving this. You, you get to the point of respect for farms, farming, animals, people that are involved with it. And you, and you keep that in mind and you stand in the other person's shoes. And I think the other part of it is then you're clear. So technically your content you have to know what you're talking about because if you don't have that clarity and content, 
people will find you out and they realize you're, you know, you're blowing smoke up their ass. And that's where, and, and I think that's been another benefit of traveling a lot. I've just seen a lot of different situations and you suddenly realize, I really know nothing about that. I must go and find out. So that's a long-winded way of answering. No, but, but I don't it's, know. Very, it's very interesting yeah. because you, you do bring up some of the points that other people have brought up in the past. And it, it, yeah. it is something that, God, the world could do with a little bit more empathy at times. But it's, it's, it's a massive skill set that you can, you can deliver or use across many disciplines. And it can be learned, and some people have it naturally, but it's really, yeah. really important. You did say to me, though, uh, you know, when I asked you, and you're a Simon Sinek fan like me as well, about your why, and you said it's very simple. I love cows. There is at the yeah. very root of what you do. And I know there's the second generation of having a going through the vet school. One of your daughters is becoming a vet. Yeah. So, you know, you know, there is that in your family. Your father was, was, was farming. But, you know, mm. that's still core to you, isn't it? You know, with all this work, you like to get back, and you have very, very clear understanding of the cow and what she wants. Um, is that is that is that your main why, Martin? The, that you just like love cows? Yeah, I, I, and I think uh, I, I, I suppose I suppose loving the cow or having that sort of uh, ingrained in you, and you got to be careful, Tommy. And we can all be victims when we talk about this communication stuff, and that you know it's a bit fluffy, and, yeah. and we're not serious about this. You know, and, and what are you serious about here? Uh, so, so I probably um, I, uh, I probably uh, temper it a little bit that word respect comes into it. And I think if, if, if that piece has been ingrained in you for a very, very long time, you can't avoid it. And, and I just like, I like the, the contact with cows and I enjoyed that. I mean, I hear, I hear a lot of large animal vets. Um, I say, Oh, your testing is, is, is boring or whatever. And it, it's part of the routine drudgery of, of, of work. I, I just really like it <laughs> in a bizarre way, even if there was lots of numbers. And sometimes I know there's farmers, if any farmer listens to this, who, who would have known me in the past, like, oh, you're often really grumpy at a test. But, but actually, the, the fact of having, of seeing a whole herd, being with animals the whole day, having that experience without having to yeah, even think too much about it, and having that interaction with the farmers and understanding where you are, it was a hugely valuable experience and gives you, it gives you a comfort of being around the animal. And and that gives you a sense, of, um, a very good appreciation of the nuance of where the animals are at. So, for instance, if you go to a large indoor herd, and I do quite a bit in Scandinavia now, and the only reason I, well, the reason I was in Scandinavia was, again, it was a relationship with the people more than anything else that I do there. But also they work in a very low antibiotic usage um, environment, a very restricted veterinary environment. So therefore, systems and protocols and disciplines, really, we, we had to do it. Okay, we just didn't have a choice. Uh, you can get away with some stuff here by, by sticking sticky plasters on it. You know, we can look at treatment, we'll talk about that after. But um, I, I really had to, had to understand the nuance of walking into a, a shed where there's a pen of 200 cows. And these are, the say, the high yielders, all doing average 55, 60 liters, whatever they're doing. And it, you get 10 minutes to walk through. Like, you, you don't get four days. You're on the farm for an hour and a half. Can you walk through a pen of 200 cows and pick up the nuance of what's going on in terms of the, the dome, the room and fill, the lameness, the, whatever it is? Can you just get the sense of it? And I think that's the, that's the observational piece which comes from the cow sequence training as well. But it's having that kind of love for the cow is that she, when she fills your vision, you kind of get it all, you see it. And that comes with a little bit of time, a bit of experience. And that's why I never get too fussed about systems. If some guy, and some, and some people have said to me, oh, it's all about, you know, a thousand cows and it's indoors and you're in those sort of intensive systems. But actually for me, I went to a farm about a month ago, a guy with 60 cows out in the field has constant performance problems. And, and it's as relevant. You can look at 60 cows exactly the same way as you look at a thousand cows in a shed. There's no difference as long as your observational technique is right and, you're, and you're, you can pick up on the nuance. So experienced clinicians, back to them, will have the nuance and that's what you need. And that's something, if we lose that nuance, even in the farming population, I think we'll lose a lot of our ability to uh, hook into those vital parts of animal husbandry. Because technology and data and everything like that is going to definitely aid systems in the future, but it is a huge yeah. skill to still look at the cows and, and, and ask the why question of what are they telling us as, uh, as the yeah. cow signals and you talk about. Um, you, you mentioned Scandinavia there, Martin, and mm. your, your cow solutions um, sign is behind you. That's your company that you work through. Um, mm. you, you, you do a lot of really interesting work in Scandinavia. One of the things that I found interesting you said to me was about when you're delivering 
actions to people based on those visits that you do. Mm, um, mm. And, you know, it's not a simple case of you, you go in and you see a problem and you give them a solution, you know, yeah. that solution has to be workable. So how do you, how do you construct that action for somebody that you make it achievable and uh, that you know what's not achievable? Is that down again to the nuance of understanding the people? Is that to the delivery mechanism? Is that to, to make it clear and simple? Um, because it, it's a phenomenal skill to do in, a, to, in any system or business to be able to give somebody direction that's actionable, that's completable. So how do you how, how do you how do you work that with your with your clients? Yeah, and look, it applies it applies in Ireland as well. And, and okay, so so with the Scandinavian thing, what we found was um, uh, first of all, it's really interesting because certainly in a lot of the bigger firms and pretty much all the firms actually, the the gender balance in firms would be about fifty fifty. So vets, breeding, um, a lot of the management side would be, would be female driven. And the differences it makes is it means that the work protocols in the farm are managed, they're not based on what I call animal restraint and male constraint, right? Okay. That you're not in a situation that it's all about power, right? So, so for instance, so, 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 so that's one element that you must understand who's working there. And what the family dynamics or the workforce dynamics are. And that could be language and it could be gender and it could be time. It could be work laws, right? So once you get that, you say, right, what's possible here? So I see a lot of technical solutions and they are, oh, you know, we must dose every cow with propylene glycol uh, three times a day after calving. Yeah. If you get a wholesome cow, she's 800 kilos. Nobody, nobody is going to catch that cow and dose her unless you design a system that, that you can do it. So you make sure before you give that advice that you're giving advice on where to put the head gate. You're giving advice on where, how to get the cow in. Uh, for instance, if we want to give 40 liters of oral fluids to a cow after calving, if that's part of a protocol, say one of those farms, and the people who are looking after the maternity section are all female, I'm never, I'm not gonna, or, or if they're guys who are smaller, I'm not gonna ask them to lift 40 liters or 20 liter buckets repeatedly. So you must put the hot water tap nearby. You must put the bucket on a trolley. You must raise it up enough. You can put an agar's pulp into it. All those kind of things. So everything you do, you break it down as how do you do the job? So why are you going to do it? Yeah, back to the Simon Sinek model. What are you going to do? And how are you going to do it? So process and procedure, everything. And we don't write it all down a lot of the time. But we, I will ask the question. So for instance, in that instance, I will ask, whoever is in charge. Okay, we need to dose the cows. How are we going to do it? And they'll say, oh, well, we have to bring the bucket from here to there. And I said, is there any easier way of bringing the bucket? What do you think? And eventually the person will actually have the solution for you. I, I rarely have it, but all I do is I ask all the awkward questions. And once you ask all the awkward questions and think of all the possible things that might go wrong, someone else will come up with a solution. Then they own it, they have it for life, that's it. End of story. And that's the principle in lean dairying as well. Lean dairy farm, we bring a lot of those models in a right first time, all that kind of stuff, is actually looking at the whole process, breaking down the process, making it workable, and also remembering that if that worker wins the lotto tomorrow, they'll be gone. So can the next person uh, do the process straight away? And that applies. We've done this on a couple of Irish farms, which has been good around the calf piece. Calf piece huge problem for a lot of people with so many calves landing we've broken down the whole process and it's not about veterinary care it's actually about how do you get a calf into the world and give it a life worth living for 12 weeks and that's the goal and get the people to do it in an easy manner that's it but they must answer the question themselves and they must do it themselves yeah, it, it, it's, it's, it's absolutely fascinating. It, it may even sound like it's uh, simple um, in, in its thought, you know, when you put it to do it and apply it and get it done is is where the real yard are won. Tough. It's tough, yeah. Tough. But when it's applied, it's really about her performance then, isn't it, Martin? And that's where you, I think, maybe, is that the position you said at the very start you talk about consultancy um, and defining that? Uh, someone asked me recently, how'd you become a consultant? Oh, we're closing the circle. Yeah. yeah. You know, someone asked me, how'd you become a consultant? I, mean, I said, well, I called myself one. That was the first bit. Uh, Jack Bobo, I said to him, how'd you become a food futurist? He said he changed his LinkedIn profile. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. How, how, yeah. Would you, how would you define that work now, Martin? And how would you define that whole consultancy piece that you do at the moment? Um, is that the right word for 
Yeah, I, I'm not sure. Um, and I often say jokingly, if I'm giving a presentation about something, you know, a consultant is someone who asks you to do something they've never done themselves. And, 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 that's, and that's something you always got, have to be careful of because if, if you don't have that intrinsic practical experience, I mean, say for instance, milking routines, and we often work out milking routines in parlors. Um, uh, if, if you're not familiar with milking machines and, and, and milking techniques and milking pits and all that kind of stuff, you will find it really difficult because you suddenly realize that you can't ask a guy, you know, who's six foot seven and is working in a plant with meters that he's banging his head off something all the time to, to do something. Or, and I find that you people say, oh, cluster dip. You know, you can't cluster dip if, you're, if your skin is sensitive to parasitic acid or if you're, if you're too tall to bend over, you're bad back, all, those kind of, all that kind of stuff. So consultant, I, I find, is a bit of a difficult word. And then you've got to bridge your knowledge across the different disciplines you work with. So if I work with corporate, what I'm trying to tell them a lot of the time is that, is that how people are going to practically respond to a product. Where does ag tech fit in with that? Is ag tech actually going to make their lives better or potentially make it worse? Who's selling it for who? Uh, what's it for? And then um, I suppose at farm level, I, I'm, I'm much more, I've, I'm becoming much more, Tommy, a, a facilitator. I spend a lot more time sitting down at tables with groups of people going, okay, who's going to do that? <laughs> okay, how are we going to do it? When are we going to do it? What's it for? It, it's, it, it's not about setting up a, a vaccine calendar. And, and this is where I find it very difficult, where we look at herd health. Herd health has been put in a box. You know, we do certain procedures and processes and we tick the box and so on. This isn't really about heart health at all. That's my expectation if I arrive on a farm in Ireland, that if they don't have IBR vaccine covered, what, why am I there? That, I, that's nothing really to do with me. That's the clinician who's going to be involved in the farm. And I, and I want the clinician to be involved in that. My job is to really look at their whole process uh, you know, you know, what, and what's going on. So facilitator is probably a better word. It's just not going to be sexy enough on a LinkedIn profile no, no, no. or so, you know, it's not, you know, there you go. And, and I'm, I, I'm really bad at that and, and, and I should be better and I probably do a lot better if I was. But I think you let, I think you let your work to the talking, Martin, and I think the results that you get show mm. what you do. So maybe titles are, are something we, we shouldn't be so worried about uh, in what we do. Yeah, it's, a, um, it's a tough one. Yeah. Yeah. yeah just, I suppose, you know, we, we caught up last week and uh, on the phone and you, you kindly said you'd give me an hour of your time today. Um, a couple of interesting things you said, you've become more of a slow thinker. Um, mm. Coming from somebody who thinks too fast, I, I, I'd love to be slow down a little bit. Um, but you also said to me, you know, we were talking about feed space and space for cows and, and all those sort of things 10 years ago. Mm. And I said, OK, Martin, what are we going to be talking about for the next 10 years? And you said something very interesting to me. What was that, Martin? What do you think the next 10 years would be like? I'm after forgetting what I said to you. I should have written it down. <laughs> no, you, you talked about what did I say? Less, less influence on the cow, less restriction on the cow, oh, and more okay, movement okay. with the cow. Um, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, okay, so, you know, we've got some, some pretty serious challenges coming down the road. I mean, the agricultural system or meat production, dairy production is under... A lot of societal pressure. I mean, we have we have a you know a, an educated middle class society who's who's looking at farming in a different way. They're very distant from it. We've an urbanized population, far less so in Ireland. I mean, it's I know we complain about it a lot in Ireland, and we complain again, you know, about pressure groups having an effect on us. But we've we see a lot of very family farms. A lot of people very bonded into their animals and into their farms. Much less so when, when we start moving abroad. So we're under different pressures. So I, I, I think the way we think about stuff and the way we think about animals and, and, we, and we get out of this argument is that there's a group of people there who don't want animals to be farmed, okay? And that's putting pressure on us. I, I think we're in a situation as responsible animal carers, and that includes farmers, families, vets, animal husbandry people, and so on. Um, we, we, we have to do what we're doing better. And I think, I think we know how to do these things better and we got to bring ourselves to it. And there's, there's issues around how we handle animals, indoor environments, outdoor environments, that we, that we have to go beyond that we're just avoiding them having a negative experience, that we're looking at how can we advance the experience for, for our animals, that they have positive benefit, that they're able to express their behavior. And that's way past five freedoms, all that kind of thing. So we look at things like the five domains, all that kind of stuff. So, so I, I think we need to look at, look at our systems again. 
I think there's huge possibility within pastoral systems where we can look at that more. And we might have to remove ourselves from monoculture systems where we look at just perennial ryegrasses and so on for all sorts of reasons. And it's interesting. I know some of the people you've spoken to um, talking about different grass wards and the, 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 the effect of the, um, the entomology, the insect populations, all these kind of things. And I think we probably, we, we have to revert back into some of that uh, integrated thinking about how we actually manage animals on farms, which make the, which, which deal with some of these arguments around how we treat animals and how they affect the environment and so on in a much more respectful and better and sensible way. Because I think if we just end up in a, in a conflict situation, say, no, 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 you know, animals are good and meat is good, dairy is good, versus everyone saying, no, 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 it's all bad. No one will go anywhere. And I, and I, think, I, I, and I think we'll miss the point. Uh, so there's a huge opportunity for us to start working on this and making it better. And that will go into farm systems. So if we look at, if we look at, uh, we've, we've learned a system which has been based on animal restraint. I think that was the point we were talking that was about. It, yeah. that was that it, was it. So we fence them in, lock them in, put them into systems. And animals then don't have a, they're probably limited on space, they're limited on stimulation, and they're limited on safety. Uh, and from that point of view, then we're dealing with environments, uh, which, is, which has an, um, a downstream affect in, in terms of the way they actually animals behave within those environments. So I think we've big opportunity there to improve uh, their, 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 their environment living without restraint uh, within our farm systems. It's still controlled, obviously, uh, but our animals are getting on better. They're having more positive experiences and things like veterinary care then have a stronger role because at the moment, to really, really create good veterinary influence in our farm systems. Uh, we need to be in that space where we bring them to a positive outcome as against just taking them from a negative to a neutral outcome, which is, which is just making them better. Because vets could find themselves sidelined in this business very quickly because they, they can get one dimensional. And, and we need to be careful of that. Vets still know most about the physiology of what's going on with animals. We are trained that way. We are trained in those diagnostic outcomes and problem solving. And I think we need to harness some of that. And that's not making us all consultants, but it's making us step up to that. Can we look at animals in, in a more unrestrained farming system? Lots of conversation around that, Tommy, I think. Yeah, I think it's really interesting because it backs up the Welfare Council is talking about a life worth living, and that's a new definition that the five sure. years are in the past. And I think it's where livestock production is going to be, whether people like it or not. And, you know, any change can be uncomfortable. Um, but I think my experience with cows is that if you do give them that life worth living and go that extra mile around behavior and space and understanding herds as a herd species, that the results can be shown in performance and profit. Um, yeah, they can. And I think this is always a bit of a challenge, Tommy, because the first time, you know, the first thing you say, oh, I need to bring in, say, a higher standard of comfort. And, and let's put, you know, comfort in this box. Everyone thinks comfort's inside the cubicle house, but let's put comfort in the collecting yard or, or whatever, right? And and the, this is one thing that I learned, and actually it was Liam Downey, and he might be every every vet's friend in the whole place, but Liam, um, uh, when he was he was uh, chairperson of ACOT Chag Chagas, um, Erad, and I was really fortunate that I worked a good bit with Liam when he was on the scientific advisory board for the Keenan Group at the time. And I think he was there because we we're really looking at this idea of feed efficiency and um, sustainable intensification. Yeah. So that idea of sustainable intensification we're talking, talking about back in maybe 2010, 2011. So, and he always said, and he was, he was dead right, it, it, if it's not profitable, it ain't going to be sustainable. And, and that's why I will make my farm system profit centric. And, and we, we have that in mind all the time. But that doesn't mean we, we can't get that other stuff right. Um, and I think, uh, and I think that's, that's a huge part of it for me. If we look at this, these ideas of sustainable intensification and stop saying that intensification is a dirty word, it's not. We can, we can intensively farm animals, but not in the definition that we think it's industrialization. And we can, we can do it safely and we can do it smartly but we're going to have to respond to some of that stuff around space and around all of that. And I think there's, there's enough money washing around in the ag system that we can actually make it either cost neutral to do that, but at best we can actually make it a profitable thing, thing to do 
potentially an added value, but also an added performance, you know? And, and I'm very encouraged, Tommy, by a lot of the farmers say that are on Twitter and so on that I, I, and I, I read. Um, there's a lot of positivity towards that if you dig around it. There's a lot of farmers there are running quite big systems and they're having a good think on this one and thinking about, okay, what can we do to actually make, make this better and get the optics on this better and make it better for us? Um, they like their herds of cows. You know, they like running. Yeah, yeah. So, so, and I think we need to capitalize on that and be brave enough to talk about some of this stuff and challenge those economic perceptions about, uh, oh, it's all about, you know, adding some new fancy cost, you know, into the system. Um, and that's probably where some of the technology fits in as well. You know, some of it's going to be very useful. Some of it is, is not. And we're going to have to sort it out. Well, I hope people continue to reach out to you and, 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 and leverage off your expertise and your thinking and your slow thinking now around. around yeah, I, I think I'm getting stupider, Tommy. It, it, actually, that's a real influencing book. I think uh, I read um, the two books I read in the last last couple of years. And I'm not I'm not saying, oh, God, I read pilot books to over intellectualize the thing. But it's it's sort of uh, I read uh, Daniel Kahneman's uh, Thinking Fast and Slow an impossible read i had to nearly take out my brain and put it back in again it's it's really tough going you kind of have to t take your time but it really gave it actually gave me a good understanding of how we should view science and how we should view fact and how you know and i'm, I'm sometimes a little worried that because everything is happening so quickly now and inf information is so fast we're accepting of a lot of narrative and a lot of stories and we're not probably as discerning as we should be about some of the fact that we need to do uh, the other book I read, Naomi Klein's "This Changes Everything," and I thought it was quite a balanced review of 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 the climate issue, and however it may pervade um, uh, how agriculture behaves itself in, in you know the next ten uh, ten or twenty years, uh, you know I think it's part of that crazy pressure we feel on ourselves as a society, where maybe we're looking for. Uh, you know, virtue and value and other things, e.g. taking up the cudgel of if I change my diet, I'm more virtuous because I can I can do something about climate. So I, I, I think it behoves us as vets or agriculturalists, farmers and so on to have a go to educate ourselves as much as we can so we can have a much more balanced and appreciative and maybe empathetic argument with people who seem to directly oppose agriculture and what it's all about. Because if, we, if we're not smart about this, we just become another group of people shouting inside the room saying how great we are. And that's what worries me again a little bit. We, I see a lot of that. You know, oh, farming is great as long as we're all telling each other. You know, I, I, think, I think we need to get out of that one and we need to be talking into a much wider audience. But if you're going to talk to a wider audience, you're going to have to learn how to shut up. And listen. You got to listen to them, yeah. There, that's a very, uh, I don't know how long that you spoke for there, but Martin, that's 30 seconds of, of very, very sound advice for, for people within agriculture, within all the disciplines that we do need to just be aware of what's around us, what's coming, and those people that have a different opinion. And that's an uncomfortable yeah. space. I mean, it's for something, yeah. something for me that I still am uh, challenged by is somebody who has a completely different perspective, who might even get on the side of annoying me, that I have to step back and put myself in mm. their, in their, into their boots and see the world as they see it. And, I, and I, it's something, a skill I'm trying to get better at. Uh, is that something that you've had to learn as well? Yeah, it's been a very tough one. I mean, I think... Um... I think also when you go through that change, I think you flip out of practice and it certainly happened to me, uh, Tommy, when you come out of your smaller bubble in one way and you can get very dogmatic and very kind of, you know, I'm right about this because I have to be right about it. Otherwise I've screwed up here, you know, big time. And, and you make yourself right about an awful lot of things and you don't listen and you don't listen to the science and you don't listen to people maybe who, who, who've gone through this. And I think that was one thing that I did learn a lot from, from traveling and going onto farms where I, and this is a disadvantage sometimes for working for commercial companies. You're often landed as being kind of the foreign guru that comes onto a farm to change everything and you get two hours to sort it out and you give an opinion and, and you head off again and you never go back there. Not, not a great system, right? And that's one thing I suppose I stayed with Scandinavia because you know, we bring who I work with up there, we, we work continuously with farms. So it's, it's much, much better. And I learn, you learn where you're wrong as well, which is important. But I did learn to go on farms where you actually have to listen to other people's points of view and other people's cultures. So, for instance, you're standing on a farm in China and talking to people. It's entirely different from talking to someone in Holland, Israel, you know, Australia, et cetera, et cetera, because the cultural influence 
the language, the communication, everything is going to be slightly different. And if you miss out again on that nuance, so the people nuance as well as the co nuance, uh, you can miss an awful lot because you're locked in your own. This is the way it is. It's right. So, and that's why I think as I'm getting older, I'm emptying, I'm trying to empty out more of the stuff I think I'm right about. Um, it, it, we did it for a company lately. We had a, we had a hard look, and I know that you're involved in this as well with the long worm piece. We, we had a real dig at the research and what, what is in behind it. And actually, as you've probably found, the research in this area is really poor. So a lot of it is open to story and narrative. And, and we're probably in a situation that we've got to tease out the fact that we've run uh, a monocultural grazing system with high intensity stocking in, in a climate changing environment of temperature and water. And, and we have a very smart parasite who just says, hey guys, I've evolved a lot longer than you have, right? So we're, I still, we're not being smart enough about this. And, and we've got a process to go down on, you know, until we are. And that really brings us to, and maybe this is, this is something that, that it could be about very years too, Tommy, is that we're struggling to have enough good clinical research being done for vets in these areas. And we often are only responding to diseases and stuff as they appear. And we're learning as we go through the disease process. And maybe that's what we've done with COVID and stuff like that too. But we need to do more stuff on this. Like there needs to be a lot more independent uh, clinical trials with normal populations and bigger scales to look at some of the stuff. We just don't know enough about it, I think. It requires a lot of funding, but I agree with you. And, and yeah, parasites sure. are certainly something that I've seen because of the environmental conditions that are a mm. great limiting factor uh, on some farms around production and profitability. And it's, it's a Big it's time, yeah. giant, um, and particularly lungworm. Is, again, this week has been, you know, I've talked to farmers, it's been, it's been you know, coughing cows. But, you know, there is people out there yeah. going about this themselves. Bruce Thompson, my very first guest, he's sitting yeah. around know, Bruce, yeah. traffic, traffic light systeming his farm based on parasite risk. Really smart thinking. Um, so there's lots yeah, of Yeah, yeah, that's novel stuff. Really we have actually, it's interesting in Sweden at the moment, um, when we're looking at some of the poor performing herds, because they've got a stipulation, herds that have to graze for so many months of the year, uh, we're seeing anecdotally okay so i don't have evidence really to back it up but anecdotally on the farms we are now running regular fluke tests okay uh so while traditionally we wouldn't have seen in those housed environments uh or semi-housed environments and certainly in that part of the world we wouldn't have seen as much parasite problems but just starting to get a bit nasty yeah. martin you uh, you're in a unique position um i suppose that you have another generation your daughters and going to find your this year well, there, yeah, yeah yeah and um, so uh, if you look back on your own career and your own veterinary career um, uh, and maybe when you have those conversations about maybe some of the mistakes you made, what have, what have been your big lessons through your career um, that have kind of guided you? Look, and everybody will have to learn their own lessons, but do you, does that make you reflect maybe on your, your own career a little bit I, more when, you, when you're done? Yeah, yeah. I, I think, first of all, um, I think credit to UCD and the vet school um, and we can and vets and practicing vets and experienced vets can criticize students and and veterinary teachers quite a bit and it often happens um, like the standard of technical information these guys have been given is just enormous I, I can't get over it. it it's I'm envious of the level of knowledge they have um, I, I certainly think the type of training that we got was very good at its time and we had a lot of very I'd say practically experienced teachers uh, within the vet school and I think it was our own fault all the time we spent too much time in the pub, maybe that we didn't that was pick up enough information. That was a very important period of learning as well. You talk about very important socializing, yeah, and, and doing all that kind of stuff. But okay, so kind of things I things I would think of uh, now when when we qualified, when I certainly when, when I qualified, way too much work without enough kind of learning. You know what I mean? We did a lot of work, but we we did that we did that time we learned on the job. Uh, and you, you have to do a certain amount of that. Uh, very simple things. Uh, always check for another calf. Yeah, that was one thing I think every vet in the country, <laughs> I hope, would have gone through. Oh, because you get that stupid phone call, there's another two feet. Yeah. Um, the other thing, I, I think the one thing that was very valuable to me in practice and, and I would have learned was learn five new things every year. Learn five new procedures, things, stuff every year. It seems like a small amount, but it's actually when you're busy and you know yourself in practice, Tommy, you don't take the time out maybe to learn a new technique or a new way of doing something. So I think learn five new things every year. Um, I think the new vets coming out uh, are going to be better supported. Uh, they're in different paid jobs 
we we were paid in, in a different way and we probably those opportunities more opportunities to make more cash in veterinary i suppose at, at that time but um uh, I, I think there'll potentially have more support there'll be more vets in the practices the better time off better work-life balance which i think is great i think also large number of vets the better conditions in general to work and i can't say that i'm generalizing now but in general conditions are better um but i think they will be really challenged by some of these leaps in agriculture because i think farming has taken leaps in the last 10 years even mm. ebi has been transformative absolutely one of the technologies that has transformed agriculture in ireland i would say is ebi anywhere i go abroad ebi is the envy of a lot of uh, consultants um we see a huge problem with genetics abroad even the genetics comes to probably shoot me for, for saying some of that, but in areas that's not been looked at correctly. Um, and it's not that the cows are wrong, it's that probably what we're looking at might be. And the fact that we've that integrated genetic system within Ireland, it, it, you know, it's just enormous. I think where vets will fit in terms of veterinary care of, of allowing animals to have a positive outcome is gonna be important. The other fear I think for them, which we didn't have, is I think the population is cutifying animals a lot. So animals are becoming cute and therefore the society's understanding of where animals are at is gonna be different. And the demands on the new vet are gonna be very different on account of that cutification. Again, I'm not saying it's wrong and I've kind of made up of that word cutification, okay? Cutification. I'm not saying it's wrong, but, but it will influence welfare, you know? Cutification, is that the word where we do you coined? Yeah. Yeah, I'm just after making up. Well, maybe it, someone has that already. I, you can get 10 people to ring in and say, <laughs> you, you know, I've, I've thought of that. But I do see there's a generation where animals are extremely, they're cuter and therefore it, it's going to be a challenge. Um, so learnings, yeah, put your hand in again and make sure there isn't another calf there. Um, I suppose, uh, just finally, you're, you're, you, you have a lot of wisdom. You, you do think a lot about things, you know, you, you read it and, and you look at uh, uh, and not just farming systems, it's yourself and your own personality. You described that as a start. Um, I suppose over the next decade, and it's, it's always, maybe it's a hard question to, to, to finish up, but you sort of covered it there earlier on. Where does agriculture need to be looking? Where are the steps, what do we need to be doing? Where do you think people's focus needs to be? Um, some of the key areas, especially for farmers now, okay? Especially for maybe farmers okay. and young people getting involved in agriculture. You, you've, you've watched the trends come and go over the last decades, you know, you, you know the next decade, where, where do we need to be focused on? Okay, I, I, at a, I suppose at a management and farm system level, people, 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 how, how people are going to be integrated well into farming, what we expect from labour, how we're going to manage labour, how we're going to teach people, how we're going to train people, how we're going to keep people, how we're going to make that life better for people working on farm. And I think uh, that, that's huge. It is huge. Um, it's the constant refrain all over the world is getting people to work and work safely and happily on farms. I think it's gonna be hugely important. And that's where some of the technologies may help us and take out some jobs that we don't need people to do. I think that's, that's actually gonna be important in tech. So I'm less worried about tech telling me whether the cow is performing well or not. Yeah, I'm actually much more concerned about tech removing some jobs that I'm, I'm having to get people to do that either I'd have to train them to do it or they're not going to do it as well. So if I can get tech to do some of those jobs, well, it would be important. Uh, the other thing I think we've got to be very careful of is get how we view our animals at, at, at farm level in, in terms of production of meat and milk and so on, and how we reconcile that view with how the greater, more urban society looks at that. And I think there's a lot of responsibility down to us to do that rather than saying, well, they need to change their view. You know, I, I think we need to look at how we view our farms, our setups, our systems, and give animals those, um, those opportunities and those, uh, to, to, to have better outcomes. Um, and, and I think we are responsible for that. Um, I, I, I think genetics will continue to, to, to uh, change our animals for the better in terms of feed efficiency, health, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, I, I, I'm not overtly concerned about us managing the antibiotic piece. I think I think that's us being being smart. Uh, I see it in other countries. We can do it. 
We went through it in the 1980s. Chlorine phenicol was taken away, furazolidone, all those things, and everyone thought the world would end. You know, I, I think this is a matter of being of being smart. And but then we've got to accept other negative effects within agriculture on account of the lack of antibiotics. And I think that's a re-education for ourselves. Um, so, it, uh, funny enough, it's it was what everyone talks about, but I actually have very few conversations on, very few, because it's a given. We just don't have, we just don't use them. That's it. It's the last on the list. The bottle of Marbisol is the last on the list. Um, and, will, and will be for a long time more. Uh, yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. Martin, um, continued success. Um, and I, I, I hope people reach out more and more to you in Cow Solutions uh, because, you know, you, you have this unique insight to farming systems and understanding that comes from experience. Uh, comes from the depth of thought, and you're a deep person. Um, <laughs> yeah, but I need I need to laugh more, Tommy. You know, and that's what I actually enjoy about some of the stuff you're doing. You actually you bring some good entertainment to this, which I think yeah, no, I, I think it's great. Yeah. Well, well life is, is very short. It was one of yeah, yeah, yeah and I had to I had to learn that, Martin. Uh, and I and I and I had a road to Damascus moment myself in practice. You know, where I was just going too hard, and I've gone back there a few sure. times since then, uh, and I was burning myself out. And, uh, you know, I'm trying to always remind myself that life is short. You get one spin in the mixer, make it as good as possible. Um, and uh, yeah, no, that, that would be my, my key thing. Yeah, um, and I think family is why I know I mentioned my dad and I know my daughter, Michaela, has been, been mentioned there as well. But actually the support of your wife and Michelle here and all those things are really important because also it helps you to understand the type of support that people need in their own, you know, when you're dealing with other people you have to have an appreciation of what support people need to get through to the next spot. And I'm sure you found that when you're, you know, you're blazing your own trail, you do need that support knocking around behind you, you know? Yeah, you know, it's critical. It's absolutely critical. Martin, um, I absolutely enjoyed our conversation. Uh, insightful uh, and as wise as always. Um, and you, you, you know, you said at the start that you said you to smile more. You smiled a lot. I was watching it for the. You, you, were, you were doing a lot of smiling. <laughs> doing that deliberately. I really, I was. I, it's it's etched on my hand to make sure I smile because other than that, yeah, yeah, yeah it's crazy. And look, uh, it's it's going to be exciting times. And working as independents, it's always a challenge that we, we obviously have to keep our incomes going and all that kind of stuff. It's been a real challenge because, you know, uh, half the income disappeared in March. You just zoom. So I'm appreciative of companies, farmers, everybody has helped out and appreciate the stuff. And, and doing this sort of stuff, Tommy, is great. You know, it, it gives people a bit of a chance to, to, get, to, to get to know you because I'm often sneaking around behind the scenes with a lot of this stuff. So, it's, yeah, so it's a great opportunity. So I do appreciate the chat. No, you're a super guy. Okay, take care. I look forward to our next chat. Uh, continue to keep challenging people. Keep, continue to keep driving our industry and animal health in the right direction. Um, and uh, best of luck to you and all your family. Take care. Thanks, Tommy. To yourself. Cheers.